strategy. If you go to the next slide, if you go to the next slide, what you'll see is that today's compensation pr approaches, like the rest of the business world, are changing very rapidly. And it's very, very important to have a bridge that connects compensation strategy to the overall business strategy. The challenge is that it's weakened with a lot of the shifts that people are making as they look at their overall business today. <laughs> I tell folks, consider the following scenario. A number of print service providers are out there reformulating their business strategy, and they really want to drive marketing services. But what they haven't done is made the necessary changes to compensation plans. That situation isn't unique. The pace of change in both business strategy and compensation design are leading many companies to consider and implement changes to one side of the bridge, and they fail to align that with the other side of the, of the bridge. As a result, what you see is that that link between strategy and compensation becomes weaker, and ultimately it undermines the overall success of the business. I used to be a sales manager, and I had several salespeople tell me over and over again that the only management direction they clearly understood was their compensation plan. Now, if you want to make that strategic shift in your business and you really want to migrate into the world of marketing services, it says that your compensation plan needs to effectively reward those individuals that are, in fact, aligned with your strategy. And so when you look at the keys to success, alignment is critical. You need to examine that alignment between business strategy and compensation frequently. And then you need to make the necessary changes to address any weaknesses in that alignment. What that means is that you've got to have a clear vision of the company's long and short-term business strategies and make sure that they're linked to compensation. You've got to choose the compensation approach that best rewards and reinforces the company's strategic goals. And then you have to periodically evaluate that compensation approach against the business strategy to see if it needs to be adjusted. The compensation plan is the critical denominator in getting everyone in the organization to move in the right and, oh, by the way, the same direction. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Matt Reese, and he's going to share with you some survey results um, from a recent study that we did and how compensation links models are evolving. And then what you're going to do is you're going to hear from Rick Alfred, Executive Vice President of Today's Graphics, and Greg Braun, Sales and Marketing Manager from Today's Graphics, and they're going to discuss actually what they're doing as the market transforms. And then Larry Braun, the founder of Ideal Printing, is going to share his perspective on compensation and what they do to address the changing services at Ideal Printing. I would ask you that if you've got questions, to merely click on my name, and what I'll do is I'll make sure that we I moderate those questions and ask them to the, of the panelists as we proceed through the webinar. And so with that, what I'm going to do is turn over to Matthew Reese. Matthew? Well, thanks, Barb, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with everybody today. What I want to share with you guys is a, is a couple of data points that we have from some recent studies. Um, and, and what we found recently is that the market focus is clearly changing relative to the portfolio of services being offered. Uh, and a recent InfoTrend study completed in November uh, of this past year titled Business Development and Professional Services That Work Service providers were asked to identify what their top new applications were. Cross-media marketing, online storefronts, website development, QR codes, and social media ranked among the highest new applications service providers were, per were pursuing. And if that's your strategic direction your company wants to follow, compensation needs to align with those goals. We also asked what marketing services respondents plan to provide within the next 12 months. And among those, email marketing, campaign response tracking and management, personalized URL generation and tracking, and data analytics all ranked among the highest. So we launched a survey, uh, and, and you know, as, as service providers begin to include digital marketing solutions into their portfolio of services, InfoTrends really wanted to better understand what some of the key differences were between an offset print sale, a digital print sale, and a repetitive digital print program sale. And we wanted to know what compensation models were being used with regards to companies that identified themselves as print service providers and as marketing service providers, 
And we also wanted to know um, what some of the core challenges sales reps faced as they made the transition from traditional offset print sales into digital print sales and also repetitive digital print program selling. The majority of the companies that we surveyed identified themselves as PSPs, where their primary services are centered around the core manufacturing of printed products. MSPs, on the other hand, are, are still providing offset print solutions, but are also more focused on digital marketing so services such as variable data printing, cross-media solutions, and data analytics. And overall, these demographic breaks are representative of the industry as a whole. Um, when looking at the size of the company surveyed, approximately 70% uh, of all the respondents fell into the category of small and medium-sized service providers with annual revenues uh, funneling under $10 million uh, in, in uh, annual sales. And when looking at the majority of the revenue and where it was coming from, PSP realizes uh, a majority of the revenue from offset print services when compared to digital printing or marketing services whereas MSPs are more engaged in offering marketing services and realize significantly more revenue through these services. So we wanted to really understand, um, get a better understanding about order cycle. And as you guys know, um, the order cycle and length of order cycle also plays into uh, how, you're, how you're compensating your sales reps. Um, for, for offset order cycles, and it, it, just to back up again, um, we're defining order cycles as uh, the entire process from when an order is requested, including all the steps involved, such as estimating and consultation, right up until the job is awarded. So with, with offset order cycles, um, PSPs had a, a very quick uh, order cycle, most often within a week, but no more than three weeks. Um, and I, I think what we've seen is that that push to the three weeks is due to the highly competitive nature of the industry, um, which can cause delays in the order cycle as, as buyers bid out work to multiple service providers, and as service providers also look to outside finishers to provide support uh, for services that some PSPs may not have in-house. Uh, MSPs had a much longer uh, order cycle. Um, and, and what we saw was that that was primarily because they were focused on working with clients and providing services that helped met the goals of a marketing campaign. Um, the offset order may also be running as part of a cross-media campaign where there are other non-print related components such as email blasts, QR codes, SMS, text, text messaging, um, et cetera. Um, and thus the, uh, the order cycle can be extended. So the, the, the picture that we really saw from an offset perspective was that uh, PSPs are focused on delivering quick turn offset production services, while MSPs are extending the offset order cycle in order to ensure that the solutions delivered met the goals of a marketing campaign. Um, hey, Matt, Matt, I have a quick question for you. When you take a look at the difference in the two models, um, and as we talk to uh, print service providers, in the marketing services play, who was initiating the sales cycle versus the print service provider? Was the print service provider reacting to a bid and buy, or the marketing services provider was much more proactive in creating the sales opportunity? Yeah, that's a good point, Barb. I'm glad you brought that up. The, the, the print service providers on whole were dealing directly with uh, print buyers, so it was more a, uh, an order fulfillment type of operation. And the marketing service providers that we talked to were really working to uh, kind of re-engineer uh, their customers' workflow, and thus the, the order cycles were um, almost a collaborative uh, uh, nature. They were uh, working closely with the marketing team versus a, a direct print buyer. Um, the, the non-repetitive digital order cycles also kind of fell into the same um, pattern, where, where a non-repetitive digital job is something that's generated um, without the use of an automated uh, web-to-print solution. Um, and again, PSPs had a very short order cycle, um, and MSPs had a much longer order cycle, three to five weeks. But when, when we talked to some of these respondents, um, the, the MSPs were also more focused on incorporating data analytics, um, and, and bring in more robust variable data solutions into that non-repetitive digital order cycle. And when, when looking at the two um, MSPs and, and PSPs, we wanted to know whether or not they offered uh, repetitive print programs um, that may be managed uh, through a web-to-print solution. And, and across the board, 
um, the majority of these uh, organizations that responded to the survey are offering competitive print programs. What we're also seeing, though, is, is that while, um, while they're offering these repetitive print programs, um, some of the MSPs, so we also wanted to figure out, well, how long does it take to move a customer into a web to print solution? Um, and while, while some of the PSPs can move a customer into a repetitive print program within one to three weeks, overall the process to educate and move that customer into that program is fairly time consuming. Um, and as, as I think some of the listeners will, will know that the, these programs are driven um, by a, almost an, an investment in time on the service provider's part to, to educate first the buyer, uh, provide demos, develop the infrastructure, and then train the end users on a system utilization. And so, so despite the, the difference between these two uh, offset models versus a repetitive print program, um, when asked uh, whether or not um, the, uh, the, the sales compensation was different, 80% um, of the respondents indicated that there was no difference in their compensation from non-repetitive digital print and offset programs to, to moving them into a program-based digital print solution. So despite the advantages of higher profitability, reduced sales involvement, and improved customer retention that come with securing reoccurring uh, digital print programs, the models of compensation uh, for capturing that business for the most part didn't change. And the, the key issue that we see with this data is that there's a lack of alignment in the desire of the management team to move into a more profitable services approach and the way that they are in fact compensating sales reps. So we were also interested in looking at the overall uh, uh, ticket sale of, of these average jobs. And, and you know, as can be expected, um, you know, roughly 80% of the respondents indicated that the typical offset print order was around $5,000 or under. So, uh, you know, a, a sizable job, not huge, um, but, but still higher than the digital print jobs. 75% of the respondents indicated uh, that their non-repetitive digital print orders were less than $1,000, and about 90% of all respondents indicated that, um, that their average digital print order was less than 3000 Repetitive digital print programs, uh, when you look at the average sale price, um, most of it was less than $500, and, and only 80% of all repetitive print programs were less than $1,000. So when looking within, within each group of respondents, you know, PSPs are relatively balanced with how they compensate their sales force for offset print sales. So you have, you have a good balance of people that are salary, salary and commission, commission only, and draw on commission. Um, whereas looking at MSPs, for the most part, they don't employ very many uh, salaried offset print sales reps. From a, from a digital perspective, the PSPs show a jump in sales reps that are compensated based on a draw against their commission and a drop in salaried sales reps, which given the long sales cycle associated with digital print programs, again causes us to have some concerns about how management is pursuing long-term, more profitable MSP work uh, or, uh, or profitable digital sales. Um, MSPs, on the other hand, have shifted dramatically away from compensation only Salesforce models uh, and show an increase in sales reps that are salaried when, when looking at the difference between their offset print models and their digital print models. So we also wanted to figure out, well, you know, how responsive has your sales team been to adopting digital print solutions into your overall sales portfolio? And, and what's encouraging is that 85% of all the respondents indicated that their sales team has been very or somewhat responsive to adopting digital print solutions into their sales portfolio. So, so the sales reps are eager to go out and sell this. They want to bring this into their, into their portfolio. Um, and when, when looking at what some of the primary obstacles that the sales reps face when transitioning from an offset print sales program into a digital print sales program, the, the largest obstacles um, we're really an unfamiliar, unfamiliar with, uh, with talking about the value add and ROI of digital print solutions, as well as the lower selling point of digital printing when compared to offset. Um, there, there's 21% answered other and, and commented uh, that um, for the most part, 
the, the cost to actually write up a digital print job and bring it in-house was cost prohibitive uh, given the selling point. So the, the picture that we're really seeing shows two predominant models of operations developing that, that need to become better aligned. On one side, we've got the quick turn, higher average sale of offset print, though with low profitability and more hands-on involvement. And on the other side, we also have uh, digital print runs, um, which have a longer sales cycle than offset with lower sales price, though higher profitability. So, so you still have digital print and offset print jobs where, where people are, are spending the day-to-day -day transaction trying to go out and inquire and meeting with customers, bringing that work in. And, and that, that kind of forms one model. And then on the other side of that, we have repetitive digital print programs, um, which take a significant amount of time and investment on the part of the PSP to execute, and uh, while resulting in a, in a lower average sell, creates an opportunity for higher profitability and uh, annuity work. Sales reps, while being somewhat responsive in adopting digital print solutions, stand in the middle of these two models. And the primary challenges that they face with, talk, with looking to aggressively pursue digital print programs, um, again, is, is an unfamiliarity uh, when talking about value add, ROI, and the lower selling point compared to offset. So if the business strategy uh, that you're looking to pursue is one that is focused on digital print and repetitive print programs, then the compensation models for this business strategy need to factor in the longer selling cycle and decrease selling price while considering the long-term benefits of higher profitability, market services focused, higher customer retention, and, and reduced overall touch point. Well, well thanks, Matt. And I, so I, what I think we're going to do next is really test with Rick, Greg, and Larry um, how people are making that transformation to align the strategy with how people are paid. And, and so what I want to do is turn it over to Rick and, and Greg to hear what's going on in today's graphics. So Rick and Greg, why don't you take it away? Okay, great. Thank, thanks so much, Barb. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, maybe set it up for Rick, uh, talk a little bit about TGI, where we came from, where we've gone for the last uh, several years. Uh, we're a 33-year-old uh, company. We started out in the typography business uh, back in 78. Uh, we made that switch to Service Bureau. We uh, made the switch back in 94 to a printing, uh, digital printing company. So we've seen a lot of change, and that's what's great about TGI and where we are and where we're going is we can, we can kind of pivot and dodge a little bit uh, more than the average uh, printer out there, which was nice. Um, Back in uh, 2001, we introduced the web to, to print uh, portals, uh, the storefronts is what we like to call them. And uh, later on, back uh, in 2006, we, uh, we introduced a suite of product, projects, uh, products because uh, a lot of our salespeople, and we'll talk about this in a minute, a lot of our salespeople uh, didn't understand how to sell these, these new programs. So we kind of packaged them for them. And uh, when that was working out a little bit pretty well, we uh, decided to separate the, the companies and kind of come up with a TGI proper and then a division which is called TGI Communications Group. So that was all uh, in reality based. You know, I'd like to say that, uh, that it, it was a smooth transition, but a lot of it's trial and error. We uh, experimentation, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And uh, I like the, uh, the slide that uh, Matt uh, showed us because it really does uh, reinforce what we'll, we're speaking about now. Um, in the early days, uh, we can go to the next slide now. Uh, in the early days, we focused on uh, the ad agency business in our in our years as typographers and uh, service bureaus. But uh, that changed back in the mid uh, mid to late 90s, where we focused a lot on the corporate market. And that again is just a transition that we saw as TGI coming from that that service bureau mentality to the printing uh, part of our business. And uh, that transition really led us into the pharmaceutical business. We have a number of part, large pharmaceutical companies that we have uh, under contract. We have uh, financial companies. And later on, we, uh, as we started to see this uh, business, uh, we grew into the higher education colleges and the smaller businesses. That's what uh, the TGI Communications Group really does is focus a little bit more on the smaller businesses that have trade shows. Uh, we've got programs for them. 
So uh, again, we have two mixes of, of, of client base. We really have uh, that larger companies with the uh, maybe print service providers, and then the more of the marketing people. So we saw that as an opportunity for us to uh, to, to focus a little bit more on uh, the marketing aspect of things. And if you looked at our database and who we have as customers, you could actually see that. You could see a lot of the people in the pharmaceutical business and financial business were these larger companies were print buyers. And uh, they were you know, a few marketers mixed in there, but predominantly they were uh, print buyers and a few marketers. And then the TGI Communications group was more of the marketing people. Now, can I, just a quick question. Yeah. When you take a look at the selling action, if I've got um, a large pharmaceutical company where I've got somebody that's focused on the print buyer, am I also having my TGI communications uh, counterpart work that same account um, to sell some of the more marketing services oriented applications, Rick? Well, that was uh, that's a great question. Um, on, on the larger companies that we have, the larger pharmaceutical companies, we actually haven't really sold uh, the marketing services because we felt that the smaller uh, type business is where we could really help out. Uh, we we feel that the larger companies they have people in place to do a lot of that stuff. So you're going to get more of a I don't want to say a wall, but it's going to be much more difficult for you to get in and sell that type of service. So we actually try to go when we use the Marcor and service the, the marketing services provider. Uh, we actually go out and try to get the more you know the the mid-sized companies, not those larger companies. We just felt that that was a an easier sell. Okay, so your your thrust really for the communications group is the S, what I'll categorize as the SMB market, which is those companies that have maybe fewer than 500 employees. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. yep. Got it. And, and if, uh, again, and going back to the, uh, the database and people that we have in here, uh, you know, we, we've got a different story to tell to each person. And the print buyers were telling one story. Uh, the marketing people were telling another story. So that's why we kind of separated the two. And to make that transition is what we did with the, the product line. If you, you see here, the MarCore, the Sales Trigger Program, Zero N. Marcor is our web to print portal, or that's what we, we, we've uh, come up with a name. We, we're, we're selling it as a, a brand, uh, and we figured that was a good way to sell this product. And all of our sales people use that lingo. When we talk about web to print, they don't use web to print. They say Marcor. Uh, okay. So we, we wanted to make it easy for them to go out there and talk about it. Uh, also, with the, the web to print, uh, we we saw a lot of companies that we were doing this with. They were doing a lot more with uh, putting in premium items, things like that. So web to print was a little bit uh, um, maybe uh, narrow, too narrow a focus for us. Great. You wanted to blend in the kidding, fulfillment, all the other pieces. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Great. Um, we go to the next. next yeah, slide. yeah, we can go to the next slide. So again, uh, two years ago we decided to make that the, the separation into today's graphics and today's communications group. Uh, again, the, uh, we've got a total of nine sales reps. Two of the sales reps we brought over to the communications group because we felt that those people were the ones that could really talk the talk and walk the walk. Uh, they had experience selling printing, but they also knew the marketing aspect of things. And Rick will talk about that in a minute. Uh, but they, they knew how to use the marketing lingo. They knew how to talk to the uh, CMOs, the, the marketing people of organizations. Even though they had that experience with the, uh, the print buyers, they knew that, 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 that talk. And, and they were the ones that really uh, transitioned smoothly over to the communications department. Not that the other people can't, and they still do. Uh, what we do is we kind of tag team it a little bit. Uh, we'll have one of these people go in with them. Uh, you know, initiate that conversation. But again, those people that you're talking to are print buyers predominantly in the larger corporations, and they may not be the person making those decisions. So we had to go a different route with that and uh, find those people out. Uh, you want to uh, go to the next? 
Yeah, so let's, uh, let's talk about the compensation. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, of uh, the nine reps we have, we, we pay on a draw, and then, you know, we give them, uh, and we, just, we, we give them 9% on what they sell. Um, so we, with these two people that we pulled out of the group, we actually, we actually changed a little bit to um, we gave them a salary and a smaller commission. Only, and our thought process behind that was that it, it is going to be a longer sale, sales process. It's going to be, uh, for us, a more challenging. But we, needed, we also recognized the fact that we needed to separate them and not put them in the same grind because I'm sure that most of us on the call today, we have you know, all that tin sitting on our floor and we feel pressured by the bottom line to uh, make sure that everything's moving and the cylinders are, are running. So we felt that let's, let's set these guys apart and not put that heavy, we need X amount from you uh, a month, uh, like you know, most sales reps have that number over their head every month, and, and the good sales reps you know, need that and, they, and they, they, they drive from that. So that's why we kind of separated um, the two out and paid them more on a, a, a salary plus a smaller commission um, on, you know, on top of that. What is, if you look at your traditional model, Matt mentioned some statistics. If I'm doing my traditional print sales model versus my TGI communications group sales model, what's the actual selling cycle that you're seeing between the two different groups in, in terms of duration? How long does it take from initiation to closing the deal and delivery? Yeah, one thing I noticed is that I think ours is a little bit longer on the on the communication group uh, model. Yes, and then even you pointed out in the in the survey, uh, I think that that ranges anywhere from uh, probably six to six months to a year in building up this business. And uh, again, that's what you couldn't really sustain a a, a print salesperson uh, focused on commission really can't sustain that. You have to as a company uh, put out that money and make sure that that. Uh, you're, you're at least making those marks, even though those, those benchmarks may be do, not dollar volume, but it may be presentations, it may be uh, getting out in front of people, getting the, the talk go. And let me ask you, you've laid out this model. Um, I've got, you know, obviously elongated sales cycles. Do you feel like the investment in TGI communications, given the annuity revenue streams, has been well worth the investment? Yes. But you have to hang in there. It's, yeah. it's going to take time. And that's yeah. why, I mean, you, you're, we always question ourselves. Um, I don't think there's anybody on the call that doesn't say, you know, is it my time or is it time to do this? Or, so, at the, you know, at the, at the start of this process, uh, I thought we, we, we felt that, hey, we've got to jump in. We've got to start it. And um, uh, you can jump ahead a slide here. I don't know if I'm – yeah, you can move yeah. that slide. Um, I think we're a little bit ahead of that. If you want to go to the next one, because I think the next one talks about, um, you know, we felt the, again that the, the traditional person always had that. I have to bring in the work. I have to get the, uh, the, um, you know, the the, 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 nut, the nut covered every month. Where these people didn't need that that that. Well, I wouldn't say pressure because they are pressured because they want to make make the sale, but they need to be very focused on figuring out what the end goal is for the client that they're calling on. And, and we do talk differently. And the good part about the process is that we also, and if you want to jump ahead one more, I think I, we talk about we have, we, we have weekly sales meetings. So those two individuals are involved in our weekly sales meetings. So it's nice to know that the other sales team is listening to the, I'm going to say it, struggles and the processes that they're going through. And now you actually see, Greg, if you would agree, that you see these guys actually, the, the, other, the other six guys are now really getting involved in talking a little bit more about it. Now, again, you know, we all, are, we all experience the guys that have been on staff for, you know, 20 years, and, and they're, 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 they're going to have a real struggle in getting, you know, making this, making this culture change here. But I still say, uh, to answer your question, it's a long-winded answer, but I think we, I, I still feel that, yes, uh, the investment is, I'm glad we did it, and I think that we don't have all the answers, but I, I can say that in, uh, I can see in three to five years, we're going to be talking so much more about the way we're doing 
with these two reps than we you know than we have been in the, in the past. So and just like Matt's uh, presentation in his presentation, I think it was uh, over 75% said they need to do this. And, and the sales reps that we have on staff now understand that they need to get involved in this uh, in the, the marketing services and the. One of the easiest ways I think that we've found, you know, we have a lot of uh, products, and uh, we mentioned Zero N and, uh, and MarCore, Email Blast. There's a lot of things in, in our toolbox, but uh, I think one of the easiest things to start with is the, the web to print or storefront, what we call MarCore. Uh, I think that's a great transition into this whole realm of, of marketing services, and it's a great tool that the sales reps can understand. They can understand that, oh, this is just another way of getting uh, printed material out to their, their customers, to their you know, customers' customers, to their distributors, or whoever it is. They understand that, that way of getting that material out. So it's a nice transition from, okay, I'm selling a job here and a job there, to I'm selling a, a concept that's going to get uh, Lots of jobs out uh, on a given day. That's great. That's also, story time. Also, uh, Barb, we have we have they actually used an outside uh, consultant to, to to try to help us, you know, start to crawl and start to walk. So uh, I think that was a, a value that we we needed. You know, we needed somebody else. We knew we were on the right track, and again, I still say we're still on that track. We're not. We haven't gotten anywhere yet, but uh, I'm glad we're on the track. And uh, and we and we see that that is going to be that's that's our future. And I, you know, we say three to five years. If it takes six to seven, I'm okay with that because I know at least right now that we're talking differently. And again, those guys that are, uh, n you know, not you know put in that group with the two, but yet, but we are involving them in the weekly sales meetings and 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 and, and getting them involved in the lingo and the confidence because. You know, we we are from a world that we we have a pad and paper, and we say, okay, how many do you want, and when you want it delivered, and 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 that's going to be real difficult to to manage and keep on going that way with everybody again on this call has probably experienced the the pricing wars that are out there, and that's just a game that I don't want to play right now. Uh, I'm that's I think we're all tired of being in that game, and again, I don't think today's graphics has all the answers, but I think that we're we're starting to taste what what's out there, and I think. Uh, we like it and uh, try to figure it out along the way. And, and I don't think anybody out there has all the answers. I think that, but the more listening you do and the sharing you do, you start to you start to get some of those uh, questions in. That's that's great. Thanks, Rick and Craig. I think you've got one last kind of wrap up slide, which is any recommendations you have, and then I'll turn over to Mr. Vaughn. So, any thoughts before I turn it over to Larry, guys? Then. Uh, well, I mean, on the screen we say, you know, separate the selling efforts from each other. I, I, I said that's, you know, we kind of focused on that. Um, you know, you want to make it separate, and you want to make it, you want to get them. Get, you, actually, we, we actually didn't talk about. We, we put some goals on the table, and uh, we, we haven't reached our numbers that we wanted. But at least, you know, when you start, like any time you do, a, I mean, every time we do a budget for the year, all our sales reps look at us and say, "Oh, you got to be kidding me, right?" Because you know who doesn't, you know. But I think we did put some numbers on a paper, and and again, we, did we do we reach the, the numbers? No, we haven't. But I think that. Uh, you, you got to have a path. You got to set something up, and I think that's something you have to probably get involved with too. Putting some numbers on a paper, and again, it's a, it's a guesstimate, but uh, it gives you some kind of path to your final goal of trying to trying to figure out who we're going to be tomorrow. Yep. And I also think with uh, the putting those numbers on paper, uh, each one of our sales reps have a a marker, which is web to print again. Uh, a, a quota for the year on those particular things. So they, the sales reps that have uh, these marketing portals, uh, I would say out of the nine sales reps that we have, uh, three of them now have uh, a web to print, and we have several web to print uh, uh, systems going on right now. So they see, they see that, that increase every year of those uh, web to print um, functions and, and the, the uh, the jobs that are coming in there, and again, we have to get better. I always say that it's a, when you sell a system, it's a business-to-business -business, uh, model. When they start buying from that web portal, it's a business-to-consumer model. 
And that's where we have to start fo focusing on that and saying, okay, how do we get more people to order more product from those websites? That's great. Well, listen, I think, th I think that's terrific insight, a great approach, and it's clear to me that you guys have at least got a strategy and you're working to align the salespeople with it. And now what I'm going to do is turn over to Larry Vaughn, and Larry's the founder at Ideal Printers, and, and get Larry's perspective relative to how he's created a culture that encourages marketing services. Larry, take it away. Hey, Barb, thank you very much, and thanks for everybody attending. We've got a great crowd on here today. I want to give you a little bit of flavor of about Ideal and, and one of the reasons that we pay the, uh, the structured program that we've had. Because we started out with a, uh, a commission-based program on some of the uh, salespeople that we had here. Then we found it wasn't, wasn't really working for some of the stuff that we had to offer to some of our customers, so uh, we, we changed it up a little bit. But when, when Ideal first uh, started, well, we started out as uh, print brokers which a lot of us uh, have started out. And of course, we, we developed, we had three employees. We had approximately 1,800 square feet. And then right after that point, you know, I got tired of depending on people to uh, print my work for me, so I started acquiring uh, offset equipment. And that was, you know, approximately about 25 years ago. Uh, and then we, we steadily expanded our capabilities. A lot of it was based on uh, customer direction of what uh, what they were requiring us for to do, what they were wanting us wanting us to do. And now, uh, 25 years later, we have uh, right around 78, 80 people and 40,000 square feet. And starting off, you know, of course, we had offset presses. Then we got into uh, digital presses, and now we offer wide format uh, web to print. We also we do uh, design and also. Uh, different type of uh, mail merge and data analytics. Next slide, please. So some of our core markets and applications, um, healthcare was probably at one time pretty much close to about 80, 85 percent of our business. And of course, you all know what's happened to a lot of the healthcare uh, industry around, and it's, it's cut back in the print, print marketing uh, business of that. And then we're into, uh, we do a lot of work with manufacturers. We do a lot of uh, kitting and fulfillment. Of course, then in Houston, we've got a, um, a large uh, oil industry in this area and then also in, in, in the technology. We first um, purchased digital equipment in 1996 when I saw it was starting to uh, make a change. And, and we were really one of the first commercial printers in the Houston area to adopt digital and now we operate multiple black and white uh, and color presses uh, here uh, here at ideal we slowly moved into um, variable data a lot of that uh, was getting you know I think uh, Rick and Greg were saying a while ago you know so far as the education to your sales rep but not only the, to your sales people you got to educate the customers and let them understand what you what you're trying to trying to sell to them. So that was a that was a slow sales cycle in its uh, in itself. And still, the majority of our work is is still uh, you know short run static. Uh, and then we have probably 30 to 40 percent of it is uh, is variable. Next slide, please. You know, in shifting from offset to digital, and we could see this transition that was uh, that was taking place. More demand, quicker turns less inventory. And so at one time we had five large offset presses, uh, all in the 40 inch range, and then we had uh, 14 small duplicators. Um, and then we, we slowly grew it uh, in response to the, to the market. Currently right now we only have one eight color perfector. You know, we, we run the dog out of it. We run it uh, three shifts, uh, six days a week. All the other equipment uh, I did sell over about a, a three year period. 40% of our work is still offset, 40% is digital, and 10 to 20% uh, percent, uh, is wide, uh, wide format. And we started getting into the wide format arena just about two years ago, maybe a little bit less than two years ago. Larry, let me ask you the same question. As you sit down and you take a look at the selling action around digital versus traditional offset, what are you seeing relative to um, the duration of the sales cycle? Well, of course, on any time that you're trying to develop a web to print program, and here again, that's why we, we changed our uh, commission structure up just a little bit, it's a longer sale. 
Uh, not only is it a, it a longer sale to educate the salesman, he feels comfortable with it, and is to educate the customer here again also to make sure that they understand what uh, what you're trying to uh, deliver. Um, but it's it's. Um, it's it, it's it's a tough, and just, I think this as Rick and Greg were talking about, you just got to hang in there and keep selling it and keep pursuing it. There are some customers, Barb, that I go to them and they get it, they understand it, and they're ready to go. And then there's some customers that it's uh, it's a year and a half, uh, year long progress, a process to get it uh, to get it changed. But some of the, some of the systems we have, we have printable, and we have the uh, HP SmartStream uh, Director. And I think there's just a graphic there of, of one of our online demo sites that we have that when we uh, show customers. And this is a site that I can go in and order my own material uh, as I make uh, as I make sales calls. And we do try to personalize everything that uh, when I go call on customers. But the uh, you know uh, prior to the web, web to print, I mean it was basically shoe leather and business cards. I mean you went out and you you made calls and the customer would call in and place a uh, phone call on an order, uh, but now by, by going to the web, web to print application, uh, the salespeople, well then they can go out, they can make the sale, and then they can go out and start developing uh, new accounts because the uh, customers, they're managing their own process so far as the order information, the proof of approval, and also uh, send it out to the cost uh, center allocations, which is big, especially in the, in the healthcare uh, industry. And again, you know, we offer a lot of appropriate training to the customers, we provide a lot of it uh, because a lot of them are, are unfamiliar with um, with this type of application. So we try to train them as uh, as much as we possibly can, and we have ongoing training. Uh, probably with some of our customers, we have uh, monthly uh, ongoing training because they have around 17,000 employees, I think. Next slide, please. You know, on the, on the sales and uh, compensation. Um, you know, it, it's basically right now we have we have two individuals and myself, so we have a total of three salespeople. And I'm a, I'm a little bit different uh, from uh, Rick and Greg. They've got you know quite a few salespeople, and I don't remember exactly how many customer service they people the people they have, but I'm a little bit swapped in that that area. Uh, I've got uh, nine or ten customer service people that help support those uh, the salespeople. The salespeople have a responsibility. It is their responsibility to go out, collect the work, get the jobs, bring them in, go get another one. Where the customer service person is their responsibility to uh, maintain the order, handle the order, and deal with the uh, the customer. Because I've found that if a salesperson stays out on the streets and does what he's supposed to do, does what they are supposed to do, uh, well, it leaves the uh, customer service to be able to interact directly with that uh, customer, and it seems like it helps the process and uh, on-time delivery a little bit better. Do so, so you, you have any special, one of the questions just came in there, do you have any special compensation for the customer service rep? We do, we do, and I think I have that in, a, in another slide here. Oh, uh, sorry Barb. about that. That's all right, Let me, I'll get to that in about half a minute. Um, and then we, we reviewed a number of the um, sales composition uh, models, you know, with um, you know, price on the sale so far as uh, some percentage of the of, of the profit, and it just wasn't working because there's some jobs that have no profit, but you want to make sure that you sell them just to continue to to handle the customers, and and we look at the big picture, not just uh, jobs uh, one off. The old sales model, like I said, I've been in, been in sales for 35 years. The old sales model is gone. I <laughs> it, it's not the, not the same as it was uh, 35 five years ago. And we've tried to hire salespeople outside of Ideal, um, and it just has not worked for us. So we've been developing our internal uh, salespeople, and we've we've been you know working with a younger group because they understand the social medias, they understand uh, you know web to print, they they they're online uh, constantly. So and that's uh, that's what you have to use when you're in any type of uh, multimedia uh, campaign. Next slide. Uh, we currently have 30 web to print programs. Uh, I think we started our web to pr print programs around uh, six years ago. Um, and like I said, you know, on the, when the web to print program is uh, implemented, well, the need for day to day day to day selling to that particular account is is uh, eliminated. But you still have to make um, 
you know, periodic calls on the customer, and of course the customer service person, they are dealing with them uh, uh, daily uh, on some accounts, and in some accounts they're dealing with them, uh, you know, on a, on, a, on a weekly basis. Offset sales are still needed. You know, like I said, you know, we offset still pays, you know, still primes a pretty, pretty good chunk of the pump around here. Um, and offset sales. You know, you can price it, you can get it, you ship it, you print it, you ship it, you bill it, and all that happens within one to two weeks. And, of course, in a lot of instances, it happens a lot less than uh, one, to, one, to, one to two weeks. Um, but, again, you know, it's not as uh, as profitable as uh, as digital, but it's it's bigger dollars, and it definitely helps to the, uh, to the overall cash flow and to the bottom line. Next slide, please. Uh, here again, you know, I've got uh, you know customer service. Got nine customer service reps. Um, some of the cur I have a customer service team that might handle one account, and then I have individual customer service people that handle multiple accounts. It just depends on the volume, the complexity, and the requirement of uh, of each one of those customers. Um, in order to 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 do that, to make sure that they're engaged with uh, with the clients, and also with the the sales reps that handle some of those particular accounts, well. I have put a, a program together for them is, is on a quarterly and yearly goals, monthly, quarterly, and yearly goals that I've put in, uh, put in for them. And I had, had, we, we had a new program that we were running. It was large format of, of whoever could sell, customer service could upsell uh, on the large format on posters and banners and signage and stuff like that. Well, I had one CSR that uh, had earned a little over $3,000 for one quarter just on meeting those goals, which was uh, which was huge, and it was uh, I think the overall by the end of the year, uh, she had an additional uh, almost ten thousand um, dollars benefited to her, uh, which is great. Which it benefited me. I mean, it was uh, I wish I could write her checks like that every year, uh, or uh, or every month. But being able to have them involved, they understand um, upselling, they understand handling the customer, uh, and it just it keeps them in tune with what uh, I, Ideal's goals are. Next slide. Larry, so, yeah. so let me, uh, so for both your sales people and your CSRs, you've got targets, and then if they meet their targets, they get a bonus. Um, what happens in an instance where I've got, I'm going to pick an existing account, does that sales rep maintain the relationship, or is the, is the, CSR responsible for expanding the sale once the sales rep gets in. They are both responsible for it, Barb. Oh, okay. uh, they the the sales rep is the head of the account. That is the person. Okay. If if it's we know we all have situations that uh, as salespeople we don't like dealing with. Um, but if it's something that needs to be at a higher level within the sales rep, it's his his or her responsibility to make sure that they go to it and they resolved resolve okay. the situation with the account. Great. But they, it's, it's kind of, you've got, I've got inside sales reps and outside sales reps. Gotcha. And so it, it uh, here again, it's worked for us. It's, you know, and, and I look at it as a win-win for everybody. The, the, the sales reps, uh, they're in it to make money. I mean, they, they've got to win. The customer service group, well, they want to work hard and, and they definitely want to be rewarded for their hard work and they should be. Um, and the customers want to feel like they're winning too, and, and what they're paying for is, is not only the product, but the service in, in which they, uh, you know, they have within the product. I mean, that's why they want to do business with you. I just, I've said many times, there's a lot of printers in town that, that operate the same presses, same equipment, same ink, same, same yeah. paper supplies that go through it. And so, what I have to offer a little bit above them is the, the service and the service end of it. On one of the one of the things I want to say is is we train our people and our customers around here constantly. We keep them engaged with new technology. We encourage them to be on Twitter. We encourage them to be on social media. Um, we have um, weekly uh, lunch and learns uh, in our back conference room that we have uh, speakers come in from substrate vendors uh, to software vendors to uh, it, even internally. We have somebody in our bindery department that teaches uh, teaches our staff here just to continue to make uh, sure they're abreast of um, 
best way to run things, uh, how to how to inform uh, how to inform their, their customers, and then also we have monthly uh, lunch and learns with uh, customers that we invite uh, to come to the shop to continue to keep them engaged. It's you know it's it's a changing world, Barb. Trying to keep up with it, and that's why I've got um, I think about six uh, young people here that that get it, understand it, they like it, and they were born with it. So that. Uh, that's that's a great story. So what we've really got, and I'm going to just do a quick wrap up here, is you've really got two different models, but I think models that give both companies good flexibility. You've got a today's graphics, which has got a group of people that's focused on the repetitive print programs that are a salary plus a commission. And basically Larry, what I hear you saying is what you've done to adjust your business model is you've basically done something relatively similar, which is you've said, I've got a salary base, and then what I've got is I've got a bonus structure that incents them to do the things that are aligned with the to, with the ideal strategy for going forward and how you want to grow the business. Very much. Um, and so what you hear is, and I'm going to just wrap up here a second, is that what you hear from both, I think, Larry, um, Greg, and Rick is that if you go to the next slide, Matt, is uh, actually is that companies big and small need to have the right compensation plan in place. And it's really, in today's market, I believe the difference between revenue growth or stagnation and demoralized sales force. If I'm dealing with a long sales cycle, I need to understand that what I'm doing is in line with management's strategic intent. And I think that the reason that compensation plans don't live up to their original goals is that people don't always understand how their plan measures and rewards them and is linked to the overall strategy. And what you've got, and I, I think it's refreshing to listen to both companies, is you've got sales meetings where you're blending the two business models. You've got Larry who's blending the customer service reps with the sales people. And what they've got are compensation systems that have been established and that are visible to the people in terms of how they're going to get paid and how they line up and align with the overall corporate set of objectives that they've established. And so the message inside is that regardless of your go-to-market strategy, and some people may be moving up the value chain to complex cross-media systems and others may be working on web to print portals, but you've got to get the products and services to market fast, and the best way you can do that is to motivate your salespeople in terms of what you want to accomplish and the products and the services that you want them to sell. And so with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank Larry, uh, Greg, Rick, and Matt for giving us good insight into the compensation models that they've put in place, what's made them successful. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, your host, Paul England. Paul? Thank you, Barb. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to say a thank you to all of our, uh, all of our, our guests on the call today and to, to Barb for being our host. And I uh, really want to thank everyone for getting on the call. And I would like to apologize for uh, the uh, slight bit of um, disconnect on the, uh, the front side of trying to get connected to this call, but uh, we'll uh, certainly take that as a lesson from our first one. So anyway, uh, again, I'd like to invite everyone to join us again on February the 1st for our next Presto call. Uh, that one's going to be entitled The Social Scene, and like I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, we're going to be covering a, um, uh, a, a, the social media aspect of promoting your business, things like uh, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and things like that. Uh, so uh, you can go to mypressgo.com to, to register for that or for any of them. And again, we'll be doing this uh, the first Tuesday of every month. And beyond that, thanks everyone for joining us, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in a month.
Anybody there? Yeah, Larry, I'm still here. Okay. Hey, I really appreciate it, Larry. Thank you a whole bunch. Uh, I thought your material was, was excellent and, uh, and uh, very much appreciate having you on here. Oh, that's no, that's no problem. Just any time, you know. Always like to try to help wherever I can, uh, you know, for whatever it is. So, but no, if uh, if y'all need anything, uh, just give me a holler. Outstanding. Appreciate it, Larry. We'll uh, see you at your place uh, in what about a about three weeks or something? Uh, I think a month from today. Matter of fact. A month from today. I think you're right. Okay. Oh. All right. Good deal. Well, let me know, guys. If I can do anything. Hey, Larry, you have Tom Lee and Chad Skelton here, too. So I just want to say hello. This is Tom speaking, and Chad wanted to make a remark. And, Larry, I just want to let you know you have an image press on the way to you. Okay. It should be there, I think, within seven business days. Okay. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, I know that Tim, he's been working on the, uh, the electrical uh, part of it, so we'll get all that set up, and we're going to have the, have the shop all cleaned up, dolled up, and it'll, it'll be a great OSA event. Outstanding, man. Take care, care of yourself. Thank you very, very much again, Larry. All right, Tom. Good talking to you. All right. Appreciate you, Larry. All right, guys. Bye-bye.